Oh, hello and welcome everyone to this exciting session by LinkedIn Java community. Today we are going to talk about the coolest new Java technology of 2021, that is Quarkus. So this is my introduction. I'm currently senior, senior year undergrad engineering student from NSUT West campus. I'm also currently working as software engineering intern at Red Hat and have been recognized as international woman in open source academic award panelist. Um, yes, I do participate in a lot of hackathons and was a featured mentor at Google Coding as well. So in today's talk, uh, in today's chat talk at this event, we are going to learn more about Quarkus. I will give context of why Quarkus, what's the need of it, and what problem it is solving in the world, right? Also, since uh, most of you are developers, and I assume open source enthusiasts as well, so I will try to cover the how to contribute to, to Quarkus part as well. And by the end, I will also share some interesting programs that Quarkus is running. And if you want, you can also be a part of it. So, uh, and one more thing, like thanks to the Quarkus team, like these slides are, are like combination of your work. So be with me and I'm sure you will enjoy learning more about Quarkus. So Quarkus is open source and it's a modern framework to write Java application and particularly these type of application, cloud native microservices and serverless applications. If you want to know about Quarkus, so it's a full stack Java framework made for JVMs. It optimizes Java specifically for containers and uh, enable it to become an effective platform for you know like serverless cloud and kubernetes environment well it can for sure help you build your long large monolith java apps as well but as a vision for the project these areas are where we focus more and put priority so with the help of quarkus you can have Java code that runs with the same speed as C++. Uh, maybe this doesn't sound much interesting because we have actually known that we can write Java apps that run with the same speed as C++, right? But what I actually mean here is how cool it will be, how interesting it will be if the code will fit in the same memory footprint, the same disk footprint, and will start incredibly fast. And let me tell you that this is just a small point. This is a very, you know, a small feature of Quarkus. Like there are many more awesome features. There are a lot more awesome stuff around Quarkus. So, in my opinion, understanding the history around Java will help us better understand the need of Quarkus. So if you remember, many people were talking about like Java is no more popular, especially for like enterprise level projects is quite fat and slow, right? These statements were very common that uh, like Java is no more uh, competitive in serverless and container environments. But have a look at this article, which talks about Java being not dead yet. If you look at these survey reports, according to these survey reports, even in 2018, as you see, Java was second most popular language and it was at number one in 2017, right? These are, these are the authorized reports by well-known institutes and companies. You can see like HackerRank is there, Redmond is there. So Java is obviously still going strong. It's still, there are so much goodness in this framework. It's, uh, it's still a full ecosystem with libraries, tools, and these things keep Java so viable, right? But like in many use cases, it's, uh, we all know it's uh, quite slow, right? It's here since so long and somewhere it's, uh, showing age like here is the true challenge like when it comes to all those libraries frameworks and all those technologies then java is going to put on a little bit of weight when we start uh, building the enterprise applications using java and start using the advanced features like let's say 
dynamic class loading, then it becomes slow. And of course, as a developer, you don't want to ruin your experience while developing apps, right? And uh, if you look at these codes, these are available online. Uh, the link, I have uh, attached the link as well. So if you try to run Java in a serverless way, this is very important. This is really very important. Let's say you want to run Java in serverless architecture like Amazon Lambda. So you will find comments like this on the internet. Like what should it take to run Spring Boot in Amazon Lambda? And there are comments like, why would you ever do that? You should never use Java with Amazon Lambda. You should never use Java with serverless architecture. You should use those lighter and fast programming languages like JS, JavaScript, Go, C++, Python, etc. And that's how and why Quark is the supersonic subatomic Java came into picture. We are trying to evolve Java for serverless and containers. You can go serverless with Java when Quark is, is here. So this is uh, like where we introduced it, the supersonic Java. It's uh, 10 times faster and 100 times smaller and 100 times smaller in many cases. It's vastly lighter weight than the Java you have before and especially for enterprise style use cases. Yes, as I said, it's very fast and like 100 times smaller. So here goes some quick benefits of Quarkus. It uh, integrates Kubernetes very efficiently. It is optimized for short-lived processes and has faster startup time as well as lower memory usage. This is really a very exciting thing around Quarkus. There are like there is enough cool features around Quarkus related to developers as well. Like 2019 saw first release of Quarkus from Red Hat, going by the open source philosophy of release early and release often. The first announcement of this product was about in March 2019. And then after the world has seen like several releases within like 11 days, a new release used to be there with new features each time. And like since then, a lot of discussion are going on about Quarkus, especially there is a huge buzz among the developers. Uh, Fox using uh, Java Cloud, Spring Boot, microservices are really going ecstatic about this new tech stack in the market. So if you talk about performance around Quarkus, so of course the performance is really awesome. It uh, has amazing boot time and incredibly low uh, RSS memory. And uh, it tailors your application for Graal VM and Hotspot. Like Graal is optional. You still get awesome performance without it as well. And it has high density memory utilization as well. So if you ask like, how is this possible? So we do it by taking out the unnecessary code first. Now, Quarkus framework and extension. When these two are combined together, they result in an outstanding performance. It becomes even more powerful. It results in reduced unneeded overheads. It migrates some startup code to build time and also makes code Kubernetes aware and more Graal friendly. Even the hard work of using Graal is made easier and uh, like often invisible since the extension framework generates the uh, adapter code, et cetera, at build time. This is important. And there are core extensions, a lot of core extension, which are part of Quarkus. They, they, and there are many more, which are like community created and owned by the community itself. So uh, like sometimes you may have heard from some people, some developers that like Quarkus is just for small apps. It's just for uh, maybe Kubernetes or native compiler. It's just a native compiler. But let me tell you, Quarkus is so, so much more truly. It's uh, not confined to only these areas. It is supersonic subatomic Java crafted from like best of breed Java libraries and standards. 
So in brief, if you discuss about the benefits of Quarkus, so first and foremost, developer joy. We wanted developers to be very productive. We wanted devs to feel the joy when they use Quarkus, when they develop something using Quarkus. And Quarkus as a framework will definitely give you a great experience. You will find things very easy and very quick. It gives you helpful, correct error messages as well when you do things wrong while developing apps, so it gives you fast feedback. So the second important point is supersonic subatomic Java. It basically means two things. First, Quarkus has very low memory footprint. And second, it's very fast. These two things are really very important in the, in the cloud native world. And the third point is it unifies imperative and reactive programming models. Quarkus is uh, reactive down to the core since it's uh, based on Vertex and Nitty. And it at the same time uses a bunch of reactive frameworks and extension on top to help the developers. And finally, Quarkus incorporates and optimizes a lot of libraries that we all use in our daily work to be more productive. So to get uh, to get a picture of it, these are some of the libraries and frameworks that we support, that Quarkus supports. You can see the big names here, Hibernate, Kubernetes, OpenShift, and a lot more, right? So Quarkus uh, focus very, very heavily to make things work in Kubernetes as well. And this is where developer joy come into picture for the win. Quarkus offers you less boilerplate, better defaults, and a container-centric development approach. You, you have never seen hot code replace like this. So uh, like I would have like shown the demos as well. That's even more interesting, but like it's a short talk. So it's just an overview of what Quarkus is. That's why I'm not jumping more into the demo side, but definitely if you want, we can later on have some session about the demo as well. So yes, Quarkus is uh, obviously not just uh, for new apps. It's applicable to all forms of Java application, new, old, web-based, desktop, even CLIs as well. And uh, it's uh, definitely not just for a small app. It scales across all the ranges. And it's a, Quarkus is uh, like a practical vision of modern Java, bringing together all the parts we need to build the next generation of uh, Java masterpieces. It's not just a native compiler. It's like uh, it's uh, obviously use it where it makes sense and it definitely it's much easier with Quarkus. So it's yes, Quarkus is uh, going strong. You can see like these are the stats. Of course, we can check the startup time, memory footprint, everything through the uh, J console as well. So Quarkus uh, makes uh, Java run better in container and serverless environments. This is how usually uh, frameworks work. Like they have a long runtime. Most of the things are done during the runtime, but the Quarkus way is it uh, almost does nothing at runtime. Like it takes less time to start, uh, less memory is used and all the bootstrap classes are no longer loaded. Like these are some of the uh, secrets how Quarkus is so fast. It almost really does nothing at runtime. Uh, it do the work once and not at each start. So if you talk about the Quarkus community, so it's uh, a community of over 450 committers, all like inclusive, open. And the interesting thing is uh, like in spite of uh, the fact that Quarkus is a Red Hat product, in spite of this, like oh, the all 450 committers are not only from Red Hat, like people outside of Red Hat also contribute to it. There are many people uh, who are not Red Hatters and they're also contributing to it. And that's the that's beauty of Quarkus. So if you talk about the Red Hat angle of the community, so obviously Quarkus uh, being, a product of Red Hat follows all the 
open source principles, all the community guidelines of Red Hat. And open source is truly a way to change the world for the better. And we are trying to do so. Uh, we are trying to do the same with the help of this super cool product, with the help of Quarkus. So if you talk about the conclusion, so Java was like born in mid 1990s and has nearly 20 years of optimization for running highly dynamic monolithic application and, is, and it still remains popular among developers, right? However, we, we now live in a world dominated by cloud, IoT open source, where containers, Kubernetes, cloud native application development is a strongly recommended to deliver higher levels of productivity and efficiency, right? So we need to rethink like how Java can be best utilized to address these new deployment environments and application architectures. Quarkus makes it possible to employ a more flexible microservices based approach to building Java applications that don't adversely impact performance. And this is a detail, like this is an interesting program that Quarkus is running right now. You can check uh, more about it on the website of Quarkus. You can see like when you will click on this link, so you will be directed to this page and like you can see more details about it. You can also be a part of it. And uh, yeah, that link is uh, perhaps enough for you to know more about this exciting program. And definitely if as a developer, you want to contribute to Quarkus, uh, like here is the GitHub uh, repository of it, you can, like jump to the issues section and start contributing to it. It's uh, undoubtedly an interesting project, an open source project. So, yes. And uh, here is a quick video I wanted to show to you all. Competitive in the digital age, businesses need to develop faster, become more agile, and get to market as quickly as possible. To do this, many businesses have moved to the cloud to reduce IT costs, improve availability, and achieve greater flexibility. The benefits of the cloud are clear, but the problem. Today, business applications need to react faster. It's hard for developers to use Java in containers and in the cloud due to long startup times and large memory and compute consumption that can lead to higher costs. Quarkus is here to help. Quarkus is a Kubernetes native Java framework crafted from best of breed Java libraries that developers love. That means developers don't have to spend hours learning new technology. They get all the cool new stuff, but it feels familiar, so there's no steep learning curve. With Quarkus, amazingly fast boot time combined with an incredibly low memory footprint leads to larger container densities and higher throughput per compute node, resulting in cloud cost savings. Where traditional Java apps have struggled in the cloud, Quarkus thrives, making it great for serverless or event-driven environments or applications where process isolation and density are important, like scalable microservice architectures. Quarkus improves productivity by minimizing development cycle times. Developers are able to code faster by using its live reload capabilities, so they can make updates to the Java code on the fly. And changes take place immediately, which enables significantly faster testing. Likewise, Quarkus unifies both reactive and imperative programming, allowing developers to write high-performing code with the expressiveness of reactive streams, all together leading to greater developer output, creativity, and joy. Quarkus makes Java a leading platform in Kubernetes and serverless environments while optimizing developer joy, providing businesses with a new way to deliver applications faster, more efficiently, and at a lower cost. Learn more. So that was a short, a quick video about uh, Quarkus. So if uh, you like this uh, like brief introduction of Quarkus, you can also tweet about it. Like here, like you can find me on Twitter, on LinkedIn. This was just an introduction about Quarkus, like what the project is, what the product is, and uh, 
Yes, like there are a lot more things around Quarkus. It's not just confined to this much. It's very huge, truly. And uh, definitely, if you want demos around uh, like different extensions of Quarkus or something, you can definitely tell to Barry, to Dom, uh, like they will get in touch with the Quarkus developers. So I hope this session helped you in getting an overview of what is Quarkus and what problem it is solving in the world. And uh, yes, if you have some like uh, important, significant questions, you can definitely always DM me and you can, feel, you can feel free to put a mail as well. Like if you want to know exactly how it works with a particular extension or something, how you would like develop any app using Quarkus, any such doubt, and definitely I can give you links. I can direct you to important links. So yeah, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you very much. I, I'm not a developer, but I think it, at least, even for me, it was clear. I think I got the idea. I took the, the main points. I took some notes here about optimization, velocity, speed, uh, uh, making you know your work easier, fun, pleasure. So it, it seems to be really uh, very modern framework. And especially as, because you said, you know, it's open source it's a great opportunity for the community to go and, and give a suggestion or even change in themselves if they don't like something, if they see something that can be improved, right? Cool, thank you. So we have one question in the chat. Um, yeah. do, can you see it? Do you want yes. to? Yes, yeah, I can see it, definitely. I can see it, so uh, yes, uh, like, Time, time, I exactly can't pronounce the name, so I can understand your question. You are saying like you have the experience with Micronaut. So definitely, and of course, a big yes, you can use all your knowledge of those frameworks. If you were using uh, that framework, you can use your existing knowledge and easily migrate to Quarkus. Like there are various blogs, articles as well by the Quarkus developers around it, like how to migrate from this framework to Quarkus, from that framework to Quarkus. So definitely you can do that, yeah. So uh, I'm going to hand over to Sam now, okay? Sam is going to talk yeah. about lessons from a first time virtual conference speaker, but uh, you, you still can chat, you know, you can continue with Sonia in the chat or you can reach to her via Twitter and the other social, social uh, Rich uh, social channels. Okay. Sam, are you ready? I'm ready. Hi, everybody. I'll just share my screen. Uh, can everybody see my screen okay? That's great. So, hi, everybody. My name's Sam Burden. I just thought I'd give you an introduction to who I am. So, um, I've done quite a few talks for the LGC now. My focus has been on personal development and my journey into UX. And my talk today is based on lessons from a first time virtual conference speaker. So within this talk, I'll give you an introduction to the conference and what I talked about. Uh, what happened du uh, before, during and after the talk, five lessons learned from my experience and a summary of the experiences and what I can deliver over to you guys. So the point of my talk today is to, I suppose, help those of you who are looking to start out within their first conference talk, whether you're new, um, I suppose, starting out in your career, whether you're doing um, a career change or experienced, I kind of want to give you some ideas in terms of understanding how you can deliver, uh, I suppose, a virtual talk um, from the lessons I've learned from mine. So my talk, the conference was called the Festival of UX and Design. So this is run by uh, Mobile UX London, which is some company I knew well because I did my um, introduction to UX design course with them. And there was a call in January 2021 about looking for speakers. And I thought, okay, then I've done quite a lot of talks with the LJC. I thought, you know what, this is the next step in my career. Um, and I thought, you know, I can give it a go. Um, what, can, what can go wrong? Um, so I spoke to the organisers. I know them pretty well due to the fact that um, I still am in contact with some of the organisers and contacts within the organisation. And I said, you know, I would like to give a talk. And 
I worked with Helen to try and get a um, proposal to them to figure out what I want to talk about. And from the first point, I didn't know what I was going to talk about. And then it twigged the fact that my passion is going from my personal experience and personal development within UX, uh, particularly user research. And during COVID, I've actually been retraining um, as well as working. And I thought, okay, then I could do my talk based on a project I did in my spare time, which is based on looking at using UX research for the airline industry. This is an industry only well to the fact that I'm employed with it and I can see the pain points within the customer journey. Um, there is a massive need for UX, particularly going forward um, post COVID to be more connected with the customer and find out a bit more about um, the user's pain points. And actually the way it's going to be I suppose a USP going forward is actually being more user centric. So the talk came about and it was called um, applying UX principles to a COVID impacted airline industries customer journey of which utilize again my experience of um, UX also utilized my experience of doing um, a, pri uh, a project on the side and then also giving over I suppose my passion for wanting to be new to being new to UX, but then also applying that knowledge in a new project. So I'll just go through what happened uh, during the planning of the talk during and also um, post talk. So the purpose of my talk was to be an inspiration for people who were looking to start out in UX um, to try and be that voice in terms of trying to think, OK, then I'm in the situation where I've been training or looking for expansion into going into that field. But how do I go further? What can I do to boost my uh, profile and portfolio within, within this um, job role? So I had four weeks to plan um, after being accepted uh, to actually submit the talk. And I thought doing a virtual talk would be quite an interesting concept. I haven't done one um, in person, but doing a virtual one might be easier because A, I haven't got I'm virtual, so I haven't got to worry about looking at uh, the audience so much. Um, I haven't got to worry about, because it was post uh, pre recorded as well. I thought, okay, I haven't got to worry about messing up. I don't have to worry about um, saying the wrong things. And and I thought, yeah, it'd be the first step into conference talking. And so it took four weeks to slowly plan the script, understand a bit more what I want to talk about, key facts and figures I wanted to generate, um, looking at what technology we're using, what specifications required for the talk, um, looking at duration, understanding a bit more about um, what kind of audience members will be available, what kind of talks would be the actual conference itself. And everything went well until two days before I was supposed to submit the talk. And this is something that I didn't consider because I thought, you know, submitting a video would be fine, be less worrying than doing one in person. And as it happens, I nearly quit after, uh, after the two days. I thought, you know what, this is just too difficult. It was more the less, it was more of a cognitive load that I didn't expect. So it was more about recording myself, looking at the camera, um, trying to get a presentation deck, um, rewriting, doing a script and trying to remember every single fact and figure. And it was just so much. I had to take a step back for just a couple of hours to figure out, OK, what am I going to do? Because I can't, I, might, I myself am not very good at video editing. So I knew I had to do the talk from 25 minutes, just nonstop without pausing, just remember, try and remember the facts. So the approach I took was actually doing the presentation deck and just remember key points and uh, information that we required to um, present the story. And I had to refer back to the why I'm doing it. That stopped me from quitting. The reason why is because I wanted to, I suppose, engage with the people who are in a similar situation to me, who needed that help going forward, particularly within a COVID environment, people need to hear this sort of story and actually feel inspired that they can um, look for ways of I suppose, boosting themselves within a career change. And so, yeah, presentation went well after that slight hiccup. And the day uh, on the day I had it all planned. I was So the day itself was based on ethics within UX. Um, I was, so it's divided in two parts, myself being in the first part, but being the last speaker during that session followed by a Q&A session. And I thought, you know, listen to the speakers first, find out a bit more about them, uh, find out from their different perspectives in terms of their own um, elements within UX, ethics and UX. And so I thought, yeah, I'll be confident as well. I thought that's another challenge as well, watching myself on camera. Again, people know me, I'm one of those, I've been doing challenges to 
record myself and see what I look like on camera. I thought, you know what, it's fine. I'll be able to do it. You know, watching myself um, in a major conference, what can go wrong? It's already recorded, I ain't got worried. However, 10 minutes into the conference, I ended up coming off um, the actual, because I thought I wanted to engage with the audience and it was something I couldn't do. It was just too much. Um, and I thought I could either stay on and actually be a champion at this or, and then feel really, I suppose, unhappy and really unconfident during the Q&A session, or I could take 20 minutes out just to take some mindful exercises and actually practice breathing and just bring myself back in because otherwise you could, it causes so much anxious, um, anxiety actually. And you think, okay, re, I suppose, refigure how I want to present myself and be more positive doing the Q and A session. So I decided to do the latter, went onto the Q and A session. And for me, this really came about, I suppose, my fear of when I started doing the Q&A session, the fact that I'm surrounded by three, in fact, four um, experienced UX designers and researchers. And I think, oh my gosh, I'm a newbie here. What kind of value can I bring? And as it turns out, when you're doing the Q&A session, you're answering questions from the audience, either whether user research or how to get into UX or just general answers about research and how can you take on your own project. It actually helped to have that different perspective. And it's interesting to see like different people's ideas of those questions i didn't realize that i didn't really appreciate it at the time um so giving over my experience um and being new to it actually gave that extra edge to the talk um also one thing i forgot to mention is the fact that the one thing that shocked me out of both the q a session and doing the talk was the fact that there were over 315 people worldwide watching it didn't phase me but i was kind of shocked and thinking oh my gosh i've got all these people watching me am i good enough um so the q a session went well um although I was still a bit like oh did i do well was it okay and then post talk i had probably about 10 linkedin requests from people saying oh my god i loved your talk it was amazing it's inspiring and i'm just glad i managed to get that objective across to others who are watching it and i feel like actually i connected more with the audience than i thought i did so what are my five key lessons that I'd like to give over to you should you wish to do your first um, conference talk is don't worry about your experience level. That's one thing I came across. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm a newbie here. I'm the only person who is just coming into the field. I haven't got much working experience, but I do have a lot of experience going into this field. Any experience is good as long as you can deliver a story that's relatable, yet at the same time, it can help people to get them onto. There might be people who are at that conference who are well experienced and want to go to get that experience from others. But there might be a lot of them want to network, they want to get into the field and they want this sort of scenario to actually be relatable and actually figure out how they can, I suppose, challenge themselves more to get the way they're going to the field. So that's kind of across the board in any conference, um, whether it's virtual or not virtual, just make sure, don't worry about your experience level, it's more about delivering a story that's relatable. Lesson number two is don't worry about being perfect. That stomped me on my second, um, the, the two days before I was supposed to submit the talk. Being perfect can kill it. It's more about getting out there and actually doing the talk, making sure it's relatable, making sure it's as concise and to the message and to the point of what you want to get across. Lesson number three is plan your reason why. So for myself, it was the basically the reason why I did it. So the reason was actually just so I can help people and actually be relatable. The fact that just because I'm new to something doesn't mean I can't deliver a talk to loads of others who might be in that similar situation and actually help them and actually help them inspire them to do more. Um, because the having the reason why it also helps to plan the way you want to deliver the presentation and having those key whys throughout makes it more deliverable, makes it more engaging and it brings that better storytelling element to the process. Uh, lesson number four, this is going to be my mantra from now on, is scrap the script. <laughs> so actually, confession today, this is the first time I've done a talk without script. I found when I did the script um, during the talk, I found it was so distracting. I felt metonymous. It was so hard to remember every single fact and figure. And it was just that cognitive load where you don't need it, particularly doing a virtual talk. And you're trying to remember all um, the technical requirements and what you're trying to deliver. It's better to have a slide deck. And then having a few um, images and text to reiterate that message. It's not about, it's all about being authentic. And if you've got a, a 
script, it's not going to feel authentic. If you have some prompts, people are going to be more relatable and it's going to be more of a storytelling process. Step number five is plan ahead. So plan ahead is in a two part scenario. So when you do your um, first time virtual conference, make sure you plan a um, the technology. That's something I should have considered the first time. Um, make sure you plan what you're going to talk about. Make sure you plan your slide deck as well. Make sure it's concise and to the point and remember back to that why. Um, and then also on the other side is make sure that you plan how you want the day to go ahead. So make sure you want to know who you want to um, watch, who you want to engage with, who you want to um, find out more information about. It's all of it. The conference is about your story, but then also it's about understanding what you want to take out of it and who you want to engage with. So summary of my experience, doing a virtual talk has been the most amazing step up experience I've ever had um, in terms of my public speaking skills. It's been a real confidence speaker in, speaker in terms of actually thinking, you know what, I've broken a something that I didn't expect to do. And that was being a first time speaker and a first time UXer within a, a conference that's um, been viewed worldwide. And actually doing a virtual conference is such a big confidence booster for those of you who are looking for that step up. And no matter what experience you've got, whether you're new, whether you're career changing, whether um, you're experienced, but looking for that next step to deliver those ideas, making sure you have that why and making sure you don't have to be perfect just be yourself and being authentic and i wouldn't make sure if you have a script make sure that it's easy and less of a cognitive load have that less of that anxiety when you're delivering it and making sure that you feel comfortable doing it so thank you very much for listening to my talk today. I've got my uh, details here. I've also put um, at the bottom my blog post that I actually wrote about the um, conference itself, my reflections of what I did, and also uh, a bit more about the conference itself. So thank you very much for listening today and I'll look forward to any questions that we have. Thank you, thank you, Sam. That was great. Um, does anyone in the audience want to unmute, unmute and ask Sam a question? Oh, well, I'm inspired. <laughs> I thought it was I thought it was great. Um, I really loved your five tips at the end there, Sam, um, and especially scrap script. I'm a big fan of that. I did my first lightning talk scripted and I have never done one since. And I'm I'm remarkably a lot more confident without a script because I know what I'm talking about. So it's a lot more natural for me to speak when I know the subject well. I think, Helen. So I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah, great job. Thank you. Yeah, that's something that I like it as well, because, you know, my, my, I think that's one of my biggest fears when I have to, to deliver a talk, even for a, a five minute talk, is if I'm going to remember, you know, everything that I have to talk. And I was like, I don't have a good memory. How am I going to memorize everything? So as I said, maybe making it like a story, you know, it's easier to grow, go through it, just than it. Definitely, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Yeah. Um, I like this lesson too. What do we have here in the chat? Yeah. Another thing that I thought very important is Sam, um, be a great tip it was the why. You know, why you are doing this? Because as you gave the example, you know, when you are like having doubts and problems going on, you're like, no, step back and remember why you are doing this. And this gives you maybe courage, give you whatever you need to keep going, right? Definitely, yeah. I think it's that definitely that why I kind of I've adopted that now more in my presentations because it helps in terms of like delivery. And it helps, I think, engage with the audience as well. It helps give them a bit of a message in terms of, oh, you're doing it for this reason. Ah, now I understand a bit more. Great, yeah. And the level as well, you know, level of experience, because another thing that I always think, you know, when I'm thinking about delivering a talk, I was like, oh, but I'm so newbie. I, I don't know anything interesting that I could share. But as I said, you know, if it's something that people can relate, can learn, even if it's just a small portion of it, I think it's worth, right? Definitely, yeah. I think it's definitely, that experience needs to be more like out there now, I think. Conferences seems to have that element where you need to be like experienced or have that vast knowledge. And I think it, particularly being new, it gives that definite, that new sort of perspective that not a lot of people, I mean, there's questions that were answered in the Q and A and from somebody who's experienced, 
Um, and then for myself, it, there was two different like core questions and two sort of completely different answers. And it gives that different element that probably somebody who's experienced or experiences would give over. That's great. So do we have any questions from the audience? Sonia, are you there yet? Did you like, are you inspired to give, to deliver like a bigger, longer talk now? Yes, I truly loved the talk by Sam. It was really too awesome. I really liked each and every point that you mentioned. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk, Sam. Yeah, I really love that. <laughs> well, thank you. I really like your talk too. It's great. Thank you. Yeah. That was great. Okay, so look, if we don't have any questions more, um, oh, let me see, I think we have a question in the chat. Sam, uh, can you see the uh, chat? Emmanuel's got his hand up as well. I'm not sure if that's a question. Okay. Yeah, it's just a comment. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's a question. Hiya. It's for Saumia about uh, Quaker. I was asking um, how you're able to integrate this into um, application development, like for Android and for IDs like Android Studio. Yes, yes. So IntelliJ idea, like some of the IDs currently do should do support the Quarkus. Like there are extensions specifically for like IntelliJ Eclipse. I'm really not sure about the Android Studio thing, but like I I myself need to ask from the developers of Quarkus who are for the, like who are working on this part. I'm not sure about the Android Studio part, but definitely we do have extensions for. IntelliJ equip such IDs, yeah. And thank you so much for the question, yeah. Great. Any more questions? You can ask to Samia or Sam. Or is everybody happy? No hands. So, okay, I'm assuming that we are good for today. Thanks again, Sam and Sonia. It was there were they were there were great talks and for the community for everyone who come enjoy to to listen to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So bye. Much. Yeah. Bye. Bye bye.